Welcome to Power Talks. In today's special episode, we are discussing about youth leadership. For those who think youth are the future of a nation, live in a nation, struggling with old issues and burden of the past. If the thought would be that youths are the present of a nation, then the nation will move ahead with renewed energy and enthusiasm. When we talk about the unheard voices being heard, you recently came up with the vision, you and your team, of UNYAP, United Nations Youth Advisory Panel. A youth was unheard in Nepal. We were used, the youths in Nepal were used by the politicians for their own vested interest, but not necessarily their own issues were heard. How did you come up with this vision, and what are the expectations out of UNYAP? The Youth Advisory Panel came out of a sense uh, uh, amongst the UN country team, these 22 UN agencies, that we weren't doing very well when it came to youth. We were very conscious that this was a key group, that there were 300,000 young people joining or trying to join the workforce every year pretty much without too many prospects with the potential of young people being you know exploited in a sense for uh, for many by many different forces for all the wrong reasons uh, and that our response at the UN wasn't good enough quite frankly and 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 so the the panel was um, above uh, above all uh, a recognition that we needed to do better and we needed to get the advice of, of some kind of representation of young people from around Nepal. But this panel, we believe, is going to be part of our, our, our secret to success. We all know that the cricket team of Sri Lanka is world class, whereas in Nepal, the sports of cricket is developing since a decade only. Yet, under the supervision of a Sri Lankan coach, the under-19 team of Nepal, with the captaincy of Sakti Goshen, won the ACC tournament. What do you think that we should work on to reach to the global seat that Sri Lankan team has reached? Well, uh, I think uh, Sri Lanka cricket team is one of the best cricket teams uh, in the world that we have. I think they have won World Cup and uh, became runners-up, you know, at several uh, World Cup games. Uh, I am sure, you know, I mean, if uh, the sports ministry of Nepal make a request to the government of Sri Lanka to assist in, you know, developing the cricket, I'm sure that, you know, government will consider positively. If Nepal is to write its constitution in time, hold the parliamentary elections and restore a functioning long-term government, then what should be the economic focus for the young economic leaders of the country? Raising economic growth. Growth provides opportunities, growth provides rising living standards, growth is the surest way to reduce poverty. But to achieve this, the issues that I mentioned before, need to be tackled. Politics has to be normalized, the rules have to be enforced, the bureaucracy has to work more efficiently, and investments have to be made in physical assets and infrastructure as well as in people. Nepal is one of the least populated countries in South Asia, yet we have a clear distinction between urban youths and rural youths. Do you have a separate approach while you deal with urban youth and rural youths? I, I think you have to, although here in Nepal, the UNFPA tends to work more with the rural youth than with the urban youth but that's not a distinction that should really be made and of course we work at the national level looking at youth issues across the country whether that's rural urban whether it's young girls or young boys all of those issues related to our mandate we try to help government understand and plan appropriately and then implement appropriately to make sure that young people wherever they are from whichever ethnic group they're from, uh, whatever their talents are, that we make the most of those. What was the objective behind formulating the United Nations Youth Advisory Panel that came out from UN country teams? That's one of the uh, ways in which the UN, I think, is demonstrating its commitment to work with young people. Globally, UNFPA has led uh, agencies in using young people or having networks established whereby we can interact with young people firstly to better shape our own response but secondly also to enable us to reach out to young people and to deepen our, our relationship with young people so that we really do consciously make a difference for, for them. So the UN country team here under the leadership of the resident coordinator has indeed set up a, a youth advisory panel precisely with that in mind to understand to listen from young people and also to improve the way in which we we work with young people we've tried to configure it uh, in a particular way of course and I think it's important to note that we're not just dealing with any young people 
We've deliberately chosen to work with youth groups who work, for example, with the media. Youth groups who are working with people living with HIV and AIDS. Young people who are from uh, marginalized communities. Young people who face challenges because of their disabilities. It's a deliberate attempt, not just to work with young people, but to work with young people from those groups of society that perhaps need their voice to be heard a little bit more than it currently is. Nepal's population growth is still high, and it is estimated that by 2050, Nepal's population will be 50 million, with a higher percentage of youth population. As we all know, Nepal's governance is weak, and uh, Nepal's political scenario is not favorable for development. How is UNFPA preparing Nepal's government to prepare for this huge bulge in population? Well, I think, firstly, I think government recognizes the, the need to understand population. And government has already initiated, for example, its preparations for the census. The census will be conducted in 2011, and that will enable government across all ministries and others too to use accurate data in terms of planning. So it's very important that people do understand the numbers. Secondly, I think uh, government is also looking into the future. We've been helping government prepare a projection plan, an action plan as to the kinds of things that government should be thinking about as population grows. But the other thing that I want to stress is that there is a tendency sometimes to see uh, population as just numbers and to think about controlling those numbers. Interestingly, this year it's the 15th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development and governments around the world, and UNFPA and others, are giving thought to what that means. The big shift from Cairo was to think not just of population being counting numbers, but about making sure that everybody counted. And that's quite a big shift. So when we talk about population growth, we shouldn't be thinking about stopping growth. We should be thinking about making sure that people have access to make the choices that they would like to make about the number of children that they have or when they have those children. We should be thinking about how to anticipate the huge potential of young people. It shouldn't really be seen as a negative issue. I think it should be seen as, a, as a, an opportunity to grasp that can really propel Nepal with a, if there is a talented, employed, educated youth, then the future could be very, very bright indeed for Nepal. In cases of human rights violations and abuses anywhere in the world, it's the children who are the ultimate victims. How can OHGHR and the member states of the United Nations be more responsible and sensitive towards the future of the world? Well, I think that's a, a, very, a very profound question. And uh, Santosh, you're absolutely right that the, the future of the world uh, uh, lies in the hands of, uh, of our children and young people. Uh, and what sort of world are, are we leaving uh, for those, those next generations to take over? Um, I think, uh, the f to, to go back to the, the beginning of our discussion, um, which was about uh, dignity and equality, um, I think uh, uh, that we must always bear in mind uh, that every child needs to have an equal opportunity to live a fulfilling life along with every other child and every other person. And if a child has uh, no education, uh, not a proper roof for, over his or her head, uh, poor nutrition, uh, and maybe poor health, uh, that's, that's a bad start to life. Uh, and so I think we all need, uh, using a human rights framework, uh, to do more to ensure that the rights of children and young people are upheld, uh, beginning with true respect for their dignity and equality and their rights to get a reasonable start in life. If we work together to do that, I think that the entire world can have a better future. When we talk of citizen involvement in developing countries, normally it's the youth population that is of higher percentage. How can youths, the next generation, find their role 
in an unsuccessful achievement of mdg it's very interesting because we've been really um, thinking hard about this question and i don't know if you're aware of one of the initiatives we launched 3 years ago was something called stand up uh, and we we improved on it the first year it was called stand up and we had uh, in the first year 23 million people taking part second year we call it stand up and speak out and last year it was called stand up and take action so stand up and take action against poverty stand up and take action for the millennium development goals so last year we had 116 million people take part across the world and most of them are young people and we tied up with the guinness book of world records to give it a buzz so we are you know shattering a world record every year the largest single uh, social movement on poverty in the history of the guinness uh, book of world records mostly young people who want to do something about it so last year and it's done over a space of 3 days uh, in the space of 3 days last year we had 10 million trees planted by mostly young people in this this part of the world but it's not just planting trees but also asking the government what are you doing about your forestry policy so this year we'll be doing it from october 16 to 18 because um, 16th is the world food day 17th is the world poverty day so friday saturday sunday and i hope that your viewers will join us in big numbers so that's one part but the second part which we are thinking of really is about uh, having youth mdg monitors at the community level whether it's a village or a slum where people can locally monitor to what extent these services which are supposed to be reaching them are actually reaching them so there's a strong uh, potential for young people to become local mdg monitors and we are working on this and we'll announce something about this shortly has there been any initiative of putting this into the curriculum for schools and colleges oh yeah yeah in many places you know where again it depends on the government where the government is serious about it in many countries they have included in the curriculum as well but uh, you know the curriculum part etc will increase awareness on these goals but uh, for us it's not just awareness but people who take action a large number of nepali students are pursuing their education in us colleges the current global economic crisis suggests that there will be a cut in scholarship while obama's administration say that there will be a rise in the international seats in the us colleges what will be the status of nepali students applying for education in the us i think there's a number of points in your in your question we're very proud of the fact that nepal has the 11th largest number of students in the united states and this isn't on a per capita basis i think if you did it on a per capita basis nepal might be up in the in the top 3 but this is total number of students so the poly students have have chosen to go to the united states we're very very pleased with that and certainly the colleges and universities where they go have been pleased to to welcome them uh, i went back to my own college which is a teaching college uh, prepares primarily teachers uh, for high schools and grade schools and there were six nepali students in the middle of iowa so that was a a very pleasant surprise but also a, just an example of how diverse the population is in the schools that they go to um the scholarships are going to go down as the economy goes down uh but also there are increasing uh numbers of people who provide private scholarships to nepalis i think the the government of the united states is looking at how we can help foreign students there's no direct program yet to to look at that beyond our usual programs but um i would expect that our student numbers will remain high i think nepalis understand that they get very good quality for their money when they go to the united states uh, i would like to appeal to the students to uh do their homework as they go to the united states to use the facilities of the us education foundation the internet to inform themselves we did a program last year um that tried to identify that some of the consulting firms some of the advisory councils are not providing them with good advice and that they need to have a, an honest set of applications of forms and and information on their finances and and then a clear idea of what it is they want to do in the United States and those will get them the visa not the pre-formed answers to questions or something from the uh, some of these uh, consulting firms that are less than than honest We are grateful for the scholarships that the US government provides to innovative, creative, hard-working Nepalis students through Fulbright and East West scholarships and other scholarships that comes directly from the US colleges. However, does not this generous offer also contributes to Nepal's major issue of rent? I I think particularly for the US government sponsored programs which are the Fulbright programs, the Humphrey programs, the East West Center 
all of those require the students, once they have completed their training in the United States, to come back to Nepal for a minimum of two years. We've had uh, a lot, I've had a lot of interaction with the alumni of those programs, and they have formed an organization here in Nepal uh, for each of the scholarships and then an umbrella organization. And I find them to be among the most creative and uh, people in Nepal, they are uh, doing a variety of things in academic institutions, in business, in, in government. Uh, so we are very, very pleased with that. I think it's an example of the payback. Of, they have remained very active in, in whatever their the field of study, but also they brought back attitudes that give them a, a an idea of public service, and we're we're very, very proud of that. The public or the scholarships from the universities themselves do not carry that same requirement to come back. But I think as Nepal opens up, as it continues its democratic transition, uh, certainly those people come back uh, in greater numbers than perhaps they did at one time. I also think now with the Internet and particularly the, the connections that they can make it, they can and do make a, a real contribution. I know there is a very active uh, Nepali network in the United States that is constantly commenting on Nepali politics and constitutional development. And I had a, a Nepali American professor in my office last week who was presenting a, a, an idea on how to, to do federalism in Nepal. So I think that constant interaction, if, even if people are not physically present in Nepal, uh, perhaps their hearts and their brains are still here and looking for ways that they can contribute. And the remittances from the United States, as from so many other countries where Nepali's work are an important underpinning of the economy right now until Nepal can get its own economy up and running and provide the jobs. So I think those are all important factors that offset the loss of, of some of the, the brightest and the best that go to the United States and other countries. You've been a teacher in the past. These days, not many youngsters aim to be a teacher. How important is it that we have dedicated teachers who can raise a generation who understands global responsibility? I am a firm believer that the teachers are the, the molders along with parents. Uh, it is very, very important to have parents who are engaged and able to help their children. But teachers bring the broad, broader world. And I would hope that it's a field that um, not only in Nepal and the United States, but around the world we would attract the best and the brightest. Uh, certainly in my own country, we are working to try and reinvigorate the teaching profession and make it much more relevant for our, uh, particularly our inner city schools where the quality of education have, has gone down. I uh, remain very concerned when I hear in Nepal that teachers uh, take jobs, they receive salaries, and then they don't go to their schools. And uh, the young people who are in those schools do not have the benefit of an education that's going to be their ticket for a better future. I, I am very, very impressed with the sacrifices that are made by Nepali parents to try to overwhelm the, the problems that they see in public education in the government schools by either providing tuition for their students or getting them into a private school. And they're making sincere sacrifices. So I think uh, hopefully those sacrifices will be reflected in some career decisions by young people to go into teaching, um, looking at and in my own government. I would hope that at some point we can bring back the Peace Corps to Nepal. Uh, Peace Corps had a tradition here for a, a long, long time of providing schools in very remote areas where it was hard to attract other people to come. And I hope we can return to that, that it will soon be safe enough in Nepal that um, the government will welcome them back and we will feel that they can come back. I'm always reminded of a, a quotation from perhaps one of our most famous teachers. Um, it was a teacher who was chosen to go up in the space shuttle and lost her life in that endeavor. But uh, she used to say, I touch the future, I teach. And I would hope that uh, teachers in Nepal would see that as a, a truly important goal and continue their dedication to the young people of Nepal. There are millions of Nepali youths who follow you, who idolize you, who take you as a role model, who, who goes and bits of guys and, and achieves something that is unachievable. That's why you are a role model for millions of Nepali youths. But on the other hand, you have proven that with patience and commitment, 
long term dedication, success and prosperity can be achieved. But if we look in today's time, our, our youths have been leaving the country or even joining criminal gangs to make great gains. What would you like to tell to those kind of youths? It's quite true. If you are persistent, if you are consistent, and if you uh, have a passion that you are more or less confident about, things do work for you. If you are really passionate about what you are, what you can do, do not lose your heart just uh, by not having a president in front of you and thinking that, oh, this is something that is in the dark, you know, where will it lead me? I don't have any examples in front of me to follow. Uh, be an example yourself, you know, and then see what you can do with it. Uh, especially if it is a field which is uh, not as lucrative, uh, especially if it is a field that has not uh, proven itself in the society, um, and then uh, y you, you even have to work doubly hard. Now, besides just focusing on commercial aspect, you have tried to put a lot of social and national issues in your movies. You have raised issues on corruption in the government, traffickings of various kinds. Do your viewers get it? They do, but what we do is, uh, I mean, we're always like, uh, you know, uh, people point finger at us saying that um, our, f our films are too much commercialized and, uh, and they do not actually uh, relate to the real situation in, 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 in the society or the country. And they are too f fantastic and, and pure escapism with a lot of uh, fighting and singing being the predominant ingredients that goes into our film. But despite that, uh, we do in every most of our films uh, have uh, social issues coming up in one form or the other. I mean, it's a different thing that we might sugarcoat it with entertainment, you know, and bringing in dancing numbers or singing numbers or dancing. But there are, we do uh, sort of like uh, pinpoint social issues, whether it be women-related in the society, whether it be uh, uh, caste-related, whether it be the government's uh, corruptions or the corruption in politics, or the darker side of um, various other institutions like police force or bureaucracy, or even for that matter, the, 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 the corruptions and um, the exploitation that goes around in a, in a, in a, in a society or in a village. Uh, we do bring that out. Our audience do intend to relate with that. They do see that we have a broad of the issues in a way that they can understand. Like I did a lot of films where I was sort of like a very angry young man, frustrated with the system, with the society. And a lot of young people who saw my film those days, they identified with my character. And that was the, the motive of my character as well, to be able to relate to these general mass. Uh, and in that way we succeeded. You have already taken a major step by forming Nepal's Youth Advisory Council for the U.S. Embassy. How do you see this small but very promising step translating into several success stories in the future for Nepal? What we recognized is, again, this is a very young country. 75% of the population under the age of 35 or 72%. I remind folks, for every old man like me running around, there's three like you, three young people there. You come up with the young ideas. Yeah. Well, thanks. But so when we looked at this, we realized if we really want to make a difference in Nepal as a partner and as a friend, we need to understand. And we need to understand the young people as well. We need to know what they're what their concerns are, what their fears are, what their hopes are, how they see their nation, because this is their nation and they will shape it, inevitably. They will have to shape this future. So we decided we'd reach out to them so that we could hear from them, and we brought together a group that we identified with the help of many, many partners. And this is a group that includes Dalit and Brahmin, Janjati, Chetri. We've got Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, People from, oh gosh, from Solokumbu and Kalali and Joppa and the Valley and throughout the country. All over the world. And we wanted to sit with them and we wanted to hear from them. And that was important for us. But I think there was another benefit there. It's great for us to learn from them. And it's nice maybe for some of them to have this conversation with the American Embassy. They, everyone wants to be listened to. We're finding that as young Nepalis, they had many things in common that transcended the boundaries that exist between caste and community and ethnicity and linguistics. They said, but we're all Nepalis. Now, the biggest challenge for them, and I've asked them to, when we meet again, and we do, this is not a one-time thing for us. This is an ongoing engagement. I've asked them to tell us, what does it mean to be a Nepali today? 
You're no longer, it's no longer a Hindu kingdom. This is a, a new country. They talked great, a great deal about the richness of Nepal's ethnicity and multicultural society, and that's a wonderful thing. But I asked them, what is it, you talked about all these different ethnic groups, so what is it that unites you as young Nepalis today? And I think as they identify that, it is out of that that we're going to start to see the success stories and that this country will grow and prosper and build. And I'm looking forward, to, if we can be a small part of that, as encouraging that conversation amongst the youth across these lines. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back next week at the same time with a special episode. Till then, good luck and goodbye. Mm -hmm.